do, not just in the spiritual realm, but also the physical realm to combat the occult? So there's two different questions being asked here. In, in combating the occult and dealing with spiritual warfare, what do you do in the spiritual side of things, and what do you do in the physical side of things? Well, I think on the spiritual side, you need to do a lot of fasting. Okay. Fasting and praying. Okay. In the Bible. If you know what you believe, and you know why it's wrong, and you know how powerful God is, it's easier to overcome it. Okay. Are you referring to you personally overcoming something, or are you referring to you being an impact on other people in it? Okay. Anything else? I think in like the physical, I think it would be just to like avoid it if you can. Okay. Like if you know it's there, just don't pay attention to it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I ran into this witch the other day. I slit her throat. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, that guy's yeah. dark there, friend. Yeah. <laughs> you left her in water until she said <laughs> proclaimed she was a witch. <laughs> and then you killed her anyways, because, you know, that's just how I we roll. I burned her at the stake. <laughs> 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 well, you know, that's what some people do with abortion clinics. Just blow it up. <laughs> blow it up. Any other ideas? I'm with Nicole. If, if yeah. On the physical side... If you see a voodoo doll at the store, and, it, and I think it's a good idea not to buy it, you know. <laughs> you see people with, you know, at the call center, and there was a few people that had, like, voodoo dolls on their desks, and it was like, you guys do know what that is, right? No, screw that. Why did they have it on their desk? <laughs> because they wrote their ex-boyfriend's name on it, and it was sticking with him, so I don't know. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, weird girl that I worked with. That she had like barcode tattooed on the back of her neck and stuff. And I'm pretty sure she worships Satan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Are you sure. serious? She was very nice though. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I've met a few people with the barcodes on there. What does that mean? I don't know. Does it mean that that, interesting? that that you have a price uh. that anybody can buy you for a certain price? <laughs> that you're just a thing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been tempted to ask the people that I know with it. Uh -huh. Me too. A lot of people don't like you asking them why they got certain tattoos or what they mean for some reason. Yeah. So it makes me scared to ask. No, them. no, I'm right there too. Oh, yeah. um, especially because one of the people that I would ask potentially, um, I've accidentally, inadvertently, kind of made mad before in the past. Oh. So I really don't oh, want to <laughs> push that too far, because things are going nice and well, so it's like, just leave it alone. But I really am still curious about, what does it mean? Right. But woe is the way of life. Okay, is there any more answers to this? Um, I'm no? So, um... I want to uh, recommend this book. It is the one that we base the study of the cult off of. Um, although I did use a lot of different resources, this is the one that I we follow. We pretty much followed its outline throughout the throughout the study. Um, it's technically by Walter Martin, but not really. He died after the, before this was written. Oh. So his daughter um, took his notes and his different uh, you know things that he had done while he was alive. And then she just kind of filled in the blanks by what she knew his views were on it. Aww. So um, it was something he always desired to do, but he died before he got a chance to. So uh, that's why it says, says Jill Martin Rich. That's her. That's his daughter. And then Kurt Van Gordon helped as well. Um, so I mean, it's it's worth a read. It's not as good as the Kingdom of the Cults because you can tell he was not the one who actually penned it. I definitely didn't like her writing style. But the content was still there, and it was it was decent. I mean, it could have been better, but it was it was decent. It was worth having. So, um, especially if you're doing a study on it. <laughs> so, uh, some things that we're gonna kind of just look at kind of fast uh, tonight. This is the la really the last four chapters of the book that we're looking at tonight. Um, the first off is you know with all these different things of the cult that we've been looking at, the question keeps coming up: What is the standard for truth? Because um, you remember, if, if you look at different things, they all kind of have a different answer. If you guys remember, for instance, in the Church of Satan, you know, 
uh, Anton LaVey, you know, he's wrote the, sa the Satanic Bible and everything. It's like, well, what made you an authority? Right. Not God, because he didn't believe, like, that whole concept of that. Yeah, not Satan, because Satan wasn't a personal being. So he just kind of did it himself. So what authorized him to have that authority, to speak with that? You know, how, how do you know that he's talking about something he actually knows about? Because he calls himself the leader of the Church of Satan? I mean, that doesn't really qualify you. I can call, call myself, hey, I'm... I'm the new Jesus. That means I know everything about everything. It's like, well, no, though, I can't just claim something. There has to be something behind it. We looked at witches and how they kind of just, you know, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah. A, that's a little bit hard to define. Right. What if you do something intending for good and it actually ends up hurting somebody? Which happens often. Which happens often. <laughs> what happens if you detach from people so as to not hurt people and that hurts people? Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It's not as black and white as witchcraft makes it sound like it is. But then there's the other side of it is somebody's always going to be offended. Right. So then it leads us to the point of, you know, <laughs> hey, wh where do we do this? And uh, so which leads us back to this. What is the standard for truth? How do I know whether something is or is not wrong? And so uh, traditionally Christianity would say the Bible. Mm -hmm. But there are forms of, of, of Christianity that wouldn't even answer that. They'd say, yeah, I guess the Bible is a factor. But then there's also people. You know, I, um, go ahead. I posted this thing um, yesterday, or this morning maybe, um, from the Barna group mm -hmm. that was talking about how um, most um, Christians, when you really ask them, they have a, a secular worldview on yeah. many, many things yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. when you really get down to it. And, yeah. And it's a large. I saw that study too. It's a large percentage. I want to say it's in the 80s, right? Yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a really large percentage, which funny. It's also a very similar uh, statistic to that of, of Christians who actually read the Bible. About 80 something percent of Christians don't even actually read the Bible on a regular basis. Which Could that be coincidence? Huh? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Um, but then it's not just people in the church. It's also people in the world. Our culture decides right and wrong, which means that each culture, something is right for that culture and it's wrong for that culture. You know, Like, for instance, in the Middle East, it's okay to marry little girls. Right. I mean little girls. Twelve-year-olds. Little girls. Yeah. That's okay. But here it's wrong. Well then, so for breeding, they right start and, marrying them out, and that begs the question: So, are you saying that slavery is not really wrong? <laughs> so, are you saying it's not really wrong for me to take something from you as long as my culture says, "Hey, it's a, it's your TV is the community's TV." You know what I mean? Like that doesn't really make sense. Every everybody tries to make it as though truth is relative when that doesn't it doesn't really apply. If you go down the road and the speed limit says fifty five. Can you tell the police officer, I used to drive in the Autobahn in Germany, so that means I can drive whatever I want on that road. He'll say, no, you're not on the Autobahn in Germany. Says it's 65, so. <laughs> My spirit says, is that what you said? My speed limit. Oh. My inner speed limit. Uh, <laughs> and then also there's this idea of like a cult leader, you know, where, where this one person is a standard for truth. Um, sometimes it's ourself. You know, I just kind of have this feeling of what's right and wrong. I hate religion, but then I'm going to decide what's right and wrong. It's like, well, A, you've kind of made your own religion because you're saying – you are saying there's a standard for right and wrong, and I am the decider of that. Thereby, you are your, you are your own religion. It's kind of a little bit of a paradox, you know what I mean? It doesn't really make much sense. Um, then there's also the, the, the final standard, which really is, is, I guess, the complete opposite of Christianity, which is what the cult dwells in, experience. What feels right, and I'm I'm slightly alarmed because there's actually a growing number of Christians who base their belief in God solely on experience. Now it's not it's not bad to be convinced through it, what you feel when you're in God's presence. That's not that's not bad, but remember that there is a lot of reason and logic that goes into it. Do you, in the New Testament, for instance, where Peter says, we don't tell you just random myths. These are things that we testified ourselves. We told you what we, exactly what we saw, that Jesus Christ did in fact die on the cross, and then we saw him r rise up. We saw this with our own eyes. See, Christianity, at the base of Christianity, is reason and logic, not emotions. But in modern Christianity, it's kind of taken a downward sp spiral. It's kind of like our emotions justify everything. 
And it's like, no, that's the occult speaking. The occult dwells on ex emotions and experience. The Christian church historically has stood for reason and logic and, and, and truth. Uh -huh. You know, it's only in more recent years, which is funny because science, scientific people oh. often say, oh, I only believe in science. And, you know, Christians, they're the ones who are all caught up in emotion. The church was the one originally who, who was fighting for science. And then somewhere in, in the Middle Ages and then afterwards, things just kind of got jumbled. And, and now all of a sudden, Christians are known for not standing for truth and standing for emotions instead. It's really weird how that one played out. Um, but anyways, that's really the big the big thing there is what is the standard for truth? Most occult is most of the occult is going to say experience. Like we looked at Aleister Crowley, which his views were really nothing. I mean, his views accepted everything, so they really accepted nothing, honestly, because he just did whatever at that time. It's it's almost impossible to know what he believed in. Yet his impact then, you know, by extension, went on to impact other people like Anton Lavey. So, anyways. Um, so oftentimes when you're looking at these different things of the cult, one of the things that I found myself asking, I'm sure you guys did too, how did they get that message from the Bible? How could you possibly justify witchcraft with the Bible? Right. How could you justify and possibly justify and justify you know holding seances with the Bible? Well, I was actually telling um, telling uh, Dad and Chuck uh, last Sunday <laughs> about in this book he was talking. They were giving an example of of a pastor. Who was holding uh, seances in the parsonage? <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> and the new pastor came, and he and he's like, "Man, this place is really like spiritually dark. dark. Like, what's going on? You know?" And then they started having demonic stuff going on in the parsonage, and he's like, "What's going on? Like, one uh, their baby um, was screaming bloody murders. So they go in there. Um, something had lifted the baby up, taken off of its clothes, and written on his back with blood." And this happened multiple times. Like they're like in the same night. So it's like, well, what the what the crap? Ha we'll come to find out. That's where the pa old past used to hold the seances. Imagine that. <laughs> wow. So how did they get that message? How can you possibly justify that with the Bible? And like I said, people will justify almost anything with the Bible. So the first tool that they use is called spiritualizing the Bible. Okay, this is where you take what the Bible clearly says. And you turn it into something that means something deeper. Oh. Like, for instance, in the book of Esther. Oh, in the book of Esther, okay, a Jewish woman named Esther marries a Persian king. That's the story. Like, really simple, right? Well, yeah. no, if, if you were spiritualizing the Bible, it, everything has hidden meanings and it. it means something else. It's not, there wasn't actually a person named Esther. There wasn't actually a person named Mordecai or, 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 or Haman. These people didn't really exist. Or even if they did, you know, they're, the story is just way out of context. Like, for instance, Jesus then becomes, he's a witch, okay? And his 12 disciples aren't actually disciples. That is his coven of 13. <laughs> okay. Well, you know that that's not really true by actually reading the Bible, right? Yes. But then they still justify it saying, well, that's how that is. Say, well, no, that didn't actually happen like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Especially because Jesus was a Jew, and Jews were not real into witchcraft, remember? <laughs> Anyways, uh, another thing they do is just like with the cults, the occult redefines things. Okay? Um words lose their meaning. Like, for instance, when they say Jesus. Well, we're going to look at that in just a minute, but they're not actually talking about the Jesus that we know of, the Jesus of this. They, they use the name Jesus, but that's pretty much all the only similarity between the Jesus that, that are being mentioned. Um, sin has a different meaning because nobody – sin really isn't a thing. See I mean? In the cult, sin – there is no such thing as sin or wickedness. So if you say sin or wickedness, it's going to be more like the unjust use of your powers or something or – um, cursing instead of you know using your witchcraft for good or whatever. See okay. what I mean? It's going to have all these different meanings to it other than clear definitions. Sin is that moral wrongness that separates us from God that everyone has that we need fixed that we can't fix ourselves. Well, right. the occult would just deny that. We don't need to be saved. We can either be reincarnated or there is no hell or there is no next life or whatever. You know, they, they all have, you know, different views. Some of them believe in an ex life, some of them don't. But it's all kind of the same idea that sin doesn't exist. So as such, if there's no sin, we don't need a redeemer. 
And in fact, Anton LaVey said a lot of blasphemous things about Jesus and, and basically just scorned him. And the thing is, it's like Anton LaVey was just trying to make Christians mad. Because if you actually look at the things that he wrote in, in the Satanic Bible about Jesus and whatnot, it wasn't anything that like disproved Jesus so much as made fun of Jesus. So at the end of the day, you just have this angry Satanist who is not proving his point. He's just making fun of the, oppos the opponent's view. That's not sufficient. I'm more of a scientific person. If you're going to disagree with my view, you need to give me facts and reason and logic as to why your view is right. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do that. He just kind of made fun of it. You know, it's like, well, okay there, buddy, but that doesn't really fix the problem. Oh. So redefining terms. And another thing, um, they kind of create a God in their own image. Right. You know, whatever they want God to be, whatever they think that God would should be or whatever, that's kind of what they'll do. Rather than learning about God, they'll just kind of decide who God is, and then that's just who God is. And so then when you talk to them about God, they already have this idea in their head of what God is. Right. They use the same terms as you, but it's different. Okay? Like, for instance, God the Father is actually that, that, that divine that's out there that we're all trying to get back in touch with. Right? It's the spark that we're all trying to, you know, we're the, I mean, we're the spark and we're just trying to join back into the flame. He's the flame, you know, he's this impersonal force, you know, that's out there somewhere, you know, whatever. But when we die, we, you know, we're just going to join back in and become one with him or whatever. You know, it's not an actual personal God. It's not the God of the Bible. It's not what God told us that he is. Um, and really those three things are, are more dominant than most other things. Um. Another thing is that they'll learn their theology, they'll learn what they believe from either what they feel, from what a demon has revealed to them, or from what the world shows. You know what I mean? And so they just kind of fill in the blanks. Like, for instance, um, okay, they'll start with the with the idea like this. Okay, there is evil in the world. There's bad things that happen, right? Like Adolf Hitler. So then they'll go to step two. Either they'll deny that what Adolf Hitler did was wrong, or say that it didn't actually happen, or they'll say, okay, um... Let me think here. Because there is evil in the world, God must be evil. Okay. So God is this evil or sometimes good force that's out there that we can actually know, but we can one day be at, be at one with. See what I mean? You start with a false conclusion. Yeah. Got to a, I mean, false start, and then you got to a false conclusion. Uh -huh. Now, we know why there's evil in the world because of our sin. Right. And then we continue to sin. It wasn't just something Adam and Eve did a long time ago, but it's something that we continue to do now to this day. And every action that we take affects other people, which leads to the idea of generational curses, and we'll look at that tonight too. Um, boy, I've heard some strange things in the church. Well, you know, since I've been in the church my whole life, I've heard some strange things. And in fact, uh, one person, I know you know who I'm talking about, uh, was so convinced that um, she, as a Christian, could still uh, have uh, generational curses. Um, and I could definitely tell that it was something that people had said to her and that it had bothered her a lot. Uh, I don't know if it did in the present, but I knew it did in the past at least. See what I mean? The things that are just out there. So that it comes back to the, down to the question that Jesus asked in Matthew 16, 13 through 16. I'll read that one first. And that's what all of this comes down to. Because ultimately, if you believe in the rapture, did you know that ultimately that doesn't really matter too much? If you believe in um, that the gifts of the Spirit are for to, still for today, that really doesn't matter as much if you don't know who Jesus is. And see, a lot of times people get so off topic with people in the cults or the occult with all these other things that they're clearly wrong on, when they overlook the most important thing, who is Jesus? Because if Jesus is who he says he is, all those other things change naturally anyways. If Jesus is who he says he is, that means that there is a hell. That means that he is coming again. That means that there is a future day of punishment. That means that witchcraft is wrong. So, I mean, but if he's not really who he says he is, then all those other things don't really matter. So you can argue till you're blue in the face with an occultist about how those uh, how they're wrong on all these points of theology when the real problem is that they don't know who Jesus is. That's the crux. That's the real, uh, what is it called, the meat and the potatoes. Uh, so Matthew 16, 13 through 16 says this. Um, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, um, who had actually recently died a few years before, 
Um, he was uh, held by the people at this time. The Jews held him as a prophet. Um, Elijah, who is considered uh, one of the greatest of the prophets. Uh, but still others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. Um, he said to them, so basically, um, a really, really good, cool person, you know, really, you know, this is the happening guy. But then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, and he goes on about that. But that's not really what I want to focus on. I want to focus on this part that Peter answers, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, and that's really where it comes down to. But then in 2 Corinthians, Paul starts talking about something that, that started happening shortly after Jesus um, started the church and, and continues to today. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11.4 says, um, For if one comes... Uh, I'll just start at the beginning of the chapter. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. He's talking in metaphors here. But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Then in verse 4, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit. See, he didn't say something different from Jesus. He says another Jesus. Okay? Because oftentimes they'll claim to be talking about Jesus. They'll claim to be giving prophetic words in the name of Jesus. In their rituals, they'll they'll invoke the name of Jesus in their, spell, in their spells. But it's not the same Jesus. If some, if, if one, for if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. And here he starts making fun of them, um, these other apostles who call themselves super apostles. You know, And so he just starts talking to them in a very sarcastic tone. It, it, St. Corinthians has this complete mood change. The first part of St. Corinthians is all happy and, and carefree. Then you get to about, like, I guess that's about chapter 10 or so, yeah. and things just take a turn. <laughs> no, I guess it's 11. He, he starts getting really sarcastic, making fun of these people. It's just really funny. <laughs> anyways, um, and, uh, so anyways, he talks, he talks there about a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. So obviously what he's saying here is pay attention to what we have said. Because you're not the, what these people are saying isn't what we have said. Right. See what I mean? So obviously that he tells himself the the first step there to to realize that it's a false Jesus, a false Christ, um, if it doesn't match up with what Christ actually did reveal. So uh, an altered presentation of Jesus is a false Jesus. You may call him Jesus, but he's not actually Jesus. You know, you might even say, oh, the Jesus who is born of Mary. Well, yes, okay, but. His character you are misrepresenting, which makes him not the Jesus who is the historical Jesus that we know. Right. See, and that's kind of a big point because it's very common for people to reinvent Jesus and then just kind of, okay. Yeah. Um, using Jesus gives credibility to their beliefs, to their practices, and to their lifestyle. You'll see people claim that God told them to do something. Well, I know Jesus. He didn't tell you to do that. Yeah, he did. Uh, no, no, he didn't. So, I mean, how do you know that what they're saying didn't actually come from Jesus? By knowing Jesus. See what I mean? That's the heart of the issue is who is Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Is he who he said he is or is he something else? And in a lot of even Christianity, there's this idea that Jesus is not who he said he is. You know, some say, oh, he was just a prophet, which Jesus definitely was a prophet, but he was more than a prophet. Uh, he was just a person. Yes, he came in the flesh, but that doesn't mean that he was just a person. Okay, just because he became fully human doesn't mean that he ever ceased being fully God. Now, see, in our natural thinking, we have a big problem with that because it's like, well, he had limited understanding on things, and he wasn't able to use his full power. That means that he wasn't fully God. No, that's not what that means at all. He was still fully God. So then some people say, okay, he was an angel. No, angels are created beings. Jesus was not created. Well, okay, he's God, but he's not, I mean, he's not God. He's God, but, you know, not 
not God, you know, and it's like, well, no, actually, he is God. Well, so you're saying that him and the Father are the same person? No. Two different people. Wait, wait, wait so there's two gods? No. No, no, there's one God, okay? Yeah. But there are two different persons. Okay, well, there's three, but I'm only talking about two, okay? <laughs> Don't want you to get, get off, off of what I'm saying here. Um, well, how can that be? See, there are some things that are beyond our understanding. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible of happening. That just means we don't quite understand how it's happening. Yeah. They're actually making a, a new uh, computer uh, and actually new AI and stuff like that that are working with concepts that are actually beyond our, their understanding of how it works. And so they're just kind of trying to make it and hope that they get it right because they don't really understand oh, what they're working oh, with. So, I mean, uh, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And if they do get this, it will be the most advanced computer ever imaginable like oh, wow. i don't even know if where you can go up from there the ai systems will become something that are so fluent so um productive that i mean they'll be like people they're, but better i mean they'll be like literally we're talking about huge steps in, a step in technology here oh, wow. however once yeah. again the stuff that they're working with they don't fully understand yeah. well so that means it's impossible if you don't understand it right wrong that just means you don't understand it that's how it is with the Trinity. Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means you don't understand it. Does that make sense? So somehow, now we do know this, that the Bible will oftentimes oops, talk as one when there's a multitude of things. For instance, Jesus says, or God says, doesn't really matter, um, that in this context really doesn't matter, um, that when a husband and wife marry, that they become one. Now, obviously, he didn't mean that like they take their bodies apart and form to like 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 uh, Power Rangers or something, you know? Yeah. Mighty, mighty morph. You know, it's not it's not like that. Um, he's obviously there's there are is still two different people, but they're 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 one in the marriage. So, is it beyond reason to assume that maybe there's something similar, maybe in the in the Godhead? Possibly. We don't really know because God's only given us glimpses of it. Right. And even if we, even if he did give us a clearer understanding, we still can't comprehend it. Right. So we're a little bit limited on what does that mean. With that being said, um, people in the cult will use Jesus because it gives it, 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 that's like the that's like the the defining mark. And Christians nowadays are actually uh, very easily misled uh, because they really don't believe know what they believe anyways. So if they say the name of Jesus is like, oh, that's a seal of approval, you know, whatever. This can't be wrong because they conjured a spirit at the seance who said that it was Jesus. <coughs> it couldn't be wrong, right? Uh, See what I mean? Yeah. Um, or practices, you know, where people will do things and it's like, this is okay because it's just okay. And people <coughs> do this very, very frequently. We're actually going to look at some examples um, tonight. So here are some of the images. Uh, some of the images that people in the cult have of Jesus. They, they had like literally. Pa I actually got so frustrated that I had to stop reading the chapter and come back to it at a later time because it was just example after example of these different um, these different uh, organizations that that define Jesus and all these different things. Um, here, the ancient magic Jesus, uh, Arbitel of magic. The mystical Kabbalist Jesus, the Jupiter and Mars Jesus, the Ascended Master Jesus, <laughs> Helena, uh, I'm talking about Plavatsky, we talked about her in the cults, the Korean part-time Christ, the full moon Jesus, the Masonic Jesus. I mean, going on and on and on, page after page of all these different occults and occultic groups where, you know, where, where they have all these different ideas of Jesus. I mean, page after page, it got very annoying. So I have summarized to spare you the, annoying, the annoyance. Um, A Christ, not the only way to God. A Christ, a Savior, but you know it doesn't really matter because there's that Savior in all of us, that Redeemer. Obviously, Savior doesn't doesn't mean Savior in the sense that you think it means. Savior would actually mean just enlightened person or whatever. See what I mean? They just re redefine the terms because why not? Who needs a dictionary? It's fine. Just make it make it mean whatever you want it to mean. Hey, uh, uh, nice dress you're wearing, there, Nicole. Why not? It's a dress now. I've called it a dress, <laughs> and that makes it a dress because I said it was a dress. But it's that's a it's a tuxedo. Why not? <laughs> See what I mean? And that's the idea of the occult. I mean, they just kind of make stuff up, and then they all get together and say, "This is how it is." And it's like, it doesn't matter how many times you say that over and over again. That doesn't change the facts. You know what I mean? Like, all matters eternally exist, and actually, no. Science has shown us that 
everything can be dated. Yeah. Literally, everything that is has a date, has an age to it. We have never found a piece of matter that was eternal. Right. Never. Why? Because God already told us. He created everything. Everything that we're going to be able to put in a test tube is going to have age. Uh -huh. That's just how that goes. So that would mean that we cannot be reincarnated beings. No. Because something would have had to get that reincarnation process going. Oh, yeah. Since everything has an age. Well, okay, no, no, it's not like that. It's this this divine spark, out, this divine fire out there that we're all, you know, a spark out of, you know, uh, okay. it just, one day, everything just came, came together and just, it's like, okay, well, yeah. that's an idea, except what you're talking about is an intelligent creator. So this spark out there, this 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 thing that we're all trying to – what you're talking about is God. So is it so crazy to assume that since you're wrong about his his nature that you might be wrong about his character too? Is that such a big stretch? See what I mean? But in the cult, they don't see yes or no. They see yes and no. Oh, yeah, okay. That's, that, that's what works for you. You know, it's a very illogical-based system of belief. Anyways, um, so uh, he is a Christ. He's not the only way to God. He was an enlightened person. Um, or he did never exist. Some some occultic groups just deny that he ever existed, which, I mean, is not historical. Very few people who actually care about what history says would actually even stand by this. This is just so retarded that, I mean, <laughs> even people who deny Jesus as being the Savior still accept that he was a historical yeah. person. He was like, you know, Buddha or, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or whatever. You know, it's, it's a person who existed. It's like saying Nelson Mandela that died a few years ago. Oh, he did never actually exist. Yeah. What? Like that's just stupid. Right. You know, nobody would actually say that. Right. But yet, there's people who say this. So it's like, okay, never mind. I'm right. Uh, there are th wrong. There are some people who say this. Um, it was a myth to give blind hope to poor fools, basically. Um, not fully God, a lesser God, a representation of the divine in the universe. In other words, this divine oneness that's out there, um, somehow of itself, without Conscious thought knew that it needed to be conscious, I guess, and so became Jesus. I don't know. They all have different views on this one, but they all kind of have the same idea that not either not fully God or is a lesser God or uh, is just a representation of God or you know all these different things. I don't know. So many different things. Scientology, for instance, taught that Jesus was a member of the scenes, and so he believed in reincarnation. Well, first off, it didn't actually. They didn't actually uh, question the fact of, do the, did the scenes believe in reincarnation? Mm. But then they also didn't look at the thing of, what's your proof for Jesus being part of the scenes? Supposing that the scenes did believe in re reincarnation, which I'm not saying they didn't, but supposing that they did, what's your proof that Jesus was a part of those scenes? Mm. Okay. Once again, a lot is just speculation, stuff that just... You know, oh, it could have been. Well, I'm not really concerned with what could have been and what couldn't have been. I'm concerned with what was and what wasn't. You know what I mean? Uh, you see a lot of people in, in jails and prisons around America. There's a lot of weird occultic things where they'll take parts of different things and mesh them and then create things. Like there's a whole – and you know the thing is we need to be aware of this kind of stuff because in the prisons and in the jails, there's whole other religions that have never even been tapped into. Because they exist in the prisons and the jails. They don't exist out here. See what I mean? Huh. It's like a world, a nation within the nation. It's really weird. Yeah, stuff gets really twisted. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they'll take themes from different things, Christianity, Satan, Satanism, you know, whatever, and they'll just kind of mix things up. And then they'll add a bunch of speculation, sometimes including UFOs. Sometimes including um, what could have happened in, a, in, a, in an ancient world or an ancient civilization, a long time forgotten. And this will kind of be their catch-all. You know, um, you know, histor history is written by the victors, so it was just it was just written away with. Well, I mean, okay, I kind of get what you're saying there. That you know, history people when people win, they oftentimes make themselves out to be the good guys. I get that. Okay. I got you there. But for nothing to agree with the theory, be it archaeology. History. I mean, you go down the list of all the different things, and there's no proof of your outrageous claim, and you're still sticking with it. And there's absolutely a bunch of proof of this other thing. It's like, well, that seems like a little bit much. Um. So Jesus and Christ are different from one another. In other words, it's not Jesus the Christ. It's Jesus 
a Christ. Sure. Jesus is separate from Christ. See what I mean? Which means you can interchange that first word. Buddha Christ, Jesus Christ, uh, you know, whatever. The first word is changeable. It's Christ, and we all have a bit of that Christ in us. We are all a part of the divine. You can overcome your problems by yourself. You don't need God because you can be your own savior. You know, if, if you're having a problem, you need to reflect on your inner character, and you need to just rise above with that inner, you know, find that inner peace and stuff. And it's like, okay, I've looked inside my heart very, very deeply, and I know it's there. It's a bunch of anger, bitterness, jealousy, uh, you know, just something that's not good. I don't want to look too long at it because it's very bad. I need something to change the problem. I don't need to analyze the problem. I already know what the problem is. So, anyways... Um, if Jesus is rejected, no other point of theology matters. This is what I'm absolutely trying to get across. Um, but the thing that the thing that the that people don't realize is Jesus does not and cannot change. No matter how much you say, no matter how much you try and prove things, no matter how much you try and say things, it doesn't matter. Jesus cannot change. It is completely against his character. It's an impossibility. Um, Hebrews chapter one, verses uh, eight through twelve says. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So, once again, just really a lot out there talking about Jesus' unchanging character. So, Jesus was not created. That's the first thing. Jesus has always existed. Before he was born of the Virgin Mary, he was still God. All that happened was he took on a human body. Okay? Does that make sense? So now he is forever fully human and fully God. So he didn't change. He just took something on that he wasn't before. See, in the Old Testament, he would appear as an angel. He would appear as a, as a mighty divine being. He would appear as a person. But he would appear as these things. He wouldn't actually be those things. Now he is that. Does that make sense? Yeah. He was born of the Virgin Mary actually with a physical body his physical body was resurrected and he has kept that physical body when he comes back at the re at, at the resurrection he will be in a physical body right. his same physical body the same one with the nails in the hands the same one with the piercing in the side that same body okay so um he so he, he was not created i never thought of it that way um he was not created he is fully god Okay? He is not lesser than the Father. He is equal with the Father. Okay, There's some parts in the, in the Gospels that talk about um, the Father being greater. I don't really want to get into that tonight. I'm just acknowledging that those are there, and that's not really what he's saying. So um, we'll probably eventually look at those someday, but we're not looking at them today. I'm just pointing them out. Uh, he was born of a literal virgin. Okay, Now, what does that mean? Well, there's two kind of theories, neither of which involves God having sex with a person. If you if you believe the Mormons, God literally had sex with the woman. I mean, literally. Yes. The, as the gross as that sounds, that is what happened. However, there's two there's two solutions. A. The Holy Spirit created a fertilized egg inside of Mary. It was completely human, but it was not a human. It was not from her. He created both parts and places inside of her womb. Another equally as valid uh, uh, idea is that he took one of her eggs that was already in her womb and supplied the missing genetic material that would have been provided with a, a male. Neither of those options requires God having sex with a person. Okay, so just so just so you know, that's completely crazy. It's nonsense. And that's not what the Bible says at all. So, uh, he became fully human as well and is the only Christ. Okay, when you talk about the Christ, when the Bible talks about the Christ, it doesn't talk about a Christ. It talks about the Christ. And when it ever mentions Jesus, it always mentions Jesus as Jesus Christ. Now, Christ was not his name. 
Okay? Did you guys get that? His name wasn't Jesus Christ. His name was Jesus. He was the Christ. And so they called him Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus because he was the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Okay? Now, in the Old Testament, there were anointed people, messiahs, if you will, because they were anointed for different things. Kings, for instance. But there, in the Old Testament, it always alluded to the idea of a messiah, a person who would resolve the issues, the son of David that they were waiting for, but that person never came. There were people who were anointed for different things, but there was never the anointed one. Well, in the New Testament, it started up with Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ. And that's why they always called him Jesus Christ, because they were acknowledging him as the only Christ. And if you read through the rest of the New Testament, which, by the way, was the entire New Testament was written in the, Latin, in the end times. How crazy is that? Yeah. Pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when they were calling him Jesus Christ, they were acknowledging that this is the way of salvation. This is the way of salvation. That's why they always called him Jesus Christ. There is no other. There will never be another. There never was another. This is the one we've been waiting for. That was the good news of the gospel. If there, if there was something that came by every couple of years, I mean, it wouldn't have been that special, would it have? Right. Oh, big whoop. You know, another Jesus came. Let's wait a couple more years and there'll be another Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or another Christ, I mean. Um, so spiritual warfare. I've already talked to great lengths, in great lengths, uh, about spiritual warfare. Um, we have those lessons recorded, and they're also on Facebook if you really want an in-depth thing. So this is just going to be more quick. Um, we are always in war. As Christians, we are always in war. It's constantly going on around us. It's something that you cannot just ignore. It's something that's always happening around you. And the thing is, we, we like to pretend that we're in this safe place, you know, where if I leave Satan alone, he'll leave me alone. But the truth is, uh -huh. Satan is always prowling at our door, just waiting for when, when he can bring something up to cause us to fall. Um, so that's why it's important that we pray and we stay in the word. Every day Satan is trying to tear you down. Every day he's trying to win the war. Uh, Luke 4, 1 through 13 tells of Jesus in the wilderness. And every time that Satan keeps trying to tempt him, he answers with scripture. Yeah. Showing the importance of scripture. And what happened when, when Jesus stood firm? Satan fled. Mm -hmm. Because that's what he do when you stand. But what always happens whenever Satan runs away? He comes back. <laughs> it says, in, in some of them it says, oh, right here, it actually says in this one at the end of verse 13, he left him until an opportune time. Mm -hmm. That's what Satan does. We, we beat him, but he doesn't like go away for good. Like, oh, I've learned my lesson. This Christian is really on fire. I can't mess with him. You know, it's more of a thing like this. Okay, yeah. I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back. So then 1 Corinthians um, like 10th brain. Like what? what are we gonna do today, brain? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. <laughs> <laughs> Try and take over the world. Yeah. Okay, First Corinthians ten thirteen says, um, "No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape, also so that you will be able to endure it." And the idea here is that you don't have to sin. That's really what he's trying to get across here. There is never a situation where God forces you to sin. Like God holds you up against the wall and says, you will sin! Like, there's always the option of not sinning. There's, ne there's never going to be a time when you face this temptation that you say, this is more than any other human has ever had to be tempted. This is just, I am in a place where I have to be tempted. I mean, where I have to fall to this temptation. Now, sadly, from this, people have taken a whole thing and and said about how, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not really what he's talking about at all. Um, God oftentimes, like for instance with Paul, where, where Paul says, please take this from me. You know, he keeps asking God, please take this from me. And then, Jesus, and then God finally answers and he says, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, no, <laughs> I'm not taking this from you. You know, and that's just how you have to kind of deal with it. And those are two big things, you know. Yeah. Temptation versus, you know, hey, not everything in my life will always be something that I can deal with. First uh, Peter uh, five eight says this. But be uh, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's just waiting for somebody to screw up. First uh, John chapter four verse four says this. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So as we're talking about these different things, never forget that A, you are not doomed, you are not doomed to fail. And B, 
that there is power in the name of Jesus. Because God is greater than the devil. The devil is nothing more than a fallen angel. Now, we've looked at throughout the course of the study about the power of the demonic realm and how, you know, he's not something you should, you should definitely, you shouldn't, uh, you know, go to the weird places. You shouldn't try and conjure demons so that you can tell them what for and demand for them to leave. I've heard of Christians doing that. Um, you shouldn't play with the cultic tools like Ouija boards. That's no. not... Not good, not not good at all. You shouldn't buy tarot cards so you can teach your church about the dangers of tarot cards. <laughs> you shouldn't pretend like Satan is just powerless, help, you know, weakling. You know, we read in the book of Job, for instance, what happened then? Okay, he was able to incite the Chaldeans against Job, the different nomadic peoples against Job to take his to take his uh, his you know kill off his his livestock or take them either or. Um, he was able to cause uh, to cause weather phenomenon. Okay, yeah. that's a big thing there. The house where his sons were staying, or where his kids were having their party, that collapsed, and that was Satan's doing. Satan was able to send. It says God's fire came down from heaven. Satan was able to bring fire down from heaven. That's a big, big deal there. Yeah. We shouldn't underestimate that. You know, now obviously, now here's the other side. We as Christians don't have to fear it. And we know that it was only because God allowed him to do those things that he was allowed yes. to do those things. Yeah. And we know that God is in control. We know that God is, you know, able uh, able to always work out any situation. So there is a balance there. Mm -hmm. But don't become overly enamored with it. But don't be ignorant of it. No. Um, so, um, and here's an idea that that First uh, Corinthians says. I believe it's around chapter six somewhere. Don't hold me to that. But that we will one day judge the angels. In other words. The same demons that tempt you in this life, you are going to judge in the next. Huh. How's that for ironic? Yeah. The same demons that, that came by and, and, and kicked you when you were down, you, God has given, will, will give, not has given, this is something future tense, you will be judging them for what they have done. Huh. That's a big yeah. statement. Yeah. Like, let's put things in perspective here. You know what I mean? We are children of God. Wow. See what I mean? And just because we haven't been given resurrected bodies at this point in time doesn't mean that we have to live in fear of the demonic. You know, no. it's something don't... Oh, don't angels. Right. Oh, okay. Well, because well, there are angels too. You know, so... Right. Um, the angels that obeyed God, there's nothing to judge them for. Oh. <laughs> right? The ones that are... Because that, right. remember, that if there was something to judge them for, they would have been thrown out of heaven. Uh -huh. Right? Because that's what happened to the ones that there was something to judge them for, right? Um, also, don't forget this, that the demonic realm hates us, as Christians, more so than regular people. Right. Like, demons hate, you know, they, they just try and mess up God's creation, absolutely. But being a Christian is like the ultimate insult to a demon, and they absolutely hate it, because they haven't been given a chance of redemption. In fact, the Bible is very clear on this. Demon, angels cannot be redeemed. When they... Fall, that's it. God never gives them another chance. Okay? But we have been given that chance. Not only that, but we've been given all this this amazing thing, the earth and everything, all these things to, to see, and we've been given we've been revealed a mystery that was that angels longed to find out about. Jesus. They were in heaven scratching their heads trying to figure out what God was doing, and we got to see with our own eyes what God was doing. Right. See what I mean? So that's something. That's something. Definitely something special. Um, and obviously, in all this, remember that people are not our enemies. We don't pray down curses on people. I mean, obviously, if God told us to, we would have to. But then remember, most of the time, <laughs> at least every time that I have seen, people are just trying to call down curses on people that aggravate them. That you know, they are irritated with. Chances are, God's not going to call you to do that. I don't want to say no, he would never, because I remember a certain city called Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but pretty much, no, God's not going to have you do that. Um, people are not the enemies. You know, it's, it's, the devil is able to use people. You know, he's able to influence people, but uh, they are not the enemies. And throughout the Bible, if you look, people... Um, who are more concerned for the enemies of, for honoring God and not being with the enemies of God are the people that God honor. He doesn't honor those people who are always concerned about their enemies. So, anyways, um, 
uh, also uh, in this, especially in in America, this is this is a really big thing. Apathy and relativism, the two things that are really killing the the church in America. Apathy, eh? Why should I care? Why should I do something? Why shouldn't I just live my life and go to church on the weekends every Sunday morning? I'm at church, you know. That should be good enough. That's not Christianity. You know what I mean? And the, the thing that concerns me is a lot of people call themselves Christians, but I'm convinced that a majority of them are not Christians. Because it's not Christian to go to a church every week. You know I mean? That's not, that's not Christian. Oh, I, I'm there every Sunday morning. How does that make you a Christian? When the, the biblical definition of a Christian is someone who follows after Christ, who carries their cross after him, right? It means to die to self. In other words, sitting around all day just... Doing whatever sounds good to you all day, every day, that's not being a Christian. If there is no discipleship, if you're not God's disciple, then you're really not a Christian. See what I mean? Now, in our church, we're lucky because most of the people in our church are, are not like this. I've only met a few people, and I think all of them have left because we don't just let, you know, let them sit there and say the same stupid messages every week about, you know, we're just so excited to have you here today. <laughs> but anyways, um, there is that those things that are just killing the church. Relativism, you know, I can really do whatever I want, and it's okay. You know, I can support homosexuality because love is love. It's not though, but you know, it really doesn't matter if it is because God said no. Right? Oh, I I can have idols in my house because I just don't feel like there's any power to them. Okay, but that's not what the Bible said. See what I mean? Like, apathy and relativism is killing the church in America. Like, it's just killing it. You have very few people who are actually concerned for God's interests, who abstain from things. In fact, America really doesn't understand the word abstaining. It means not doing something, withholding from something. Okay, uh, America's not real big on that. Like, alcohol, it's fine. Pot, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Hey, all drugs, you know, why not? It's fine. Whatever. Do whatever you want. Sleep around? Yeah, that's fine too. But you're not married. That's fine. It's fine. See what I mean? And that's not God. God does have standards for us to live by. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, God, uh, Satan, not God, Satan will give full lies, but even more often he'll give us white lies, little things that are just a little bit off. And through this course of the white lies, he'll get us further and further into, you know, uh, falling for what he wants us to believe. Um, obviously, though, in all spiritual warfare, never forget this. The demons are not behind everything. They're not behind every corner. You don't have to cast demons out of everything. Okay. In Most things are not demon-possessed. Okay. However, some things are still demon-possessed. So there is like a balance between, hey, everything's demon-possessed and there's nothing demon-possessed. I mean, there is there's a, a happy little place in the middle there. They do stick their noses into everything. Come on. Um, and obviously things can distract us. Um, you know, the Bible warns a lot about stuff that we just kind of overlook. You know, like gluttony, overeating. You know, that doesn't really, that, that's fine. That doesn't apply to me because, you know, I don't think that applies to me. And I'm an American, I like to eat, you know. Okay. Well, that <laughs> doesn't really make it okay just because you don't want to admit it. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, other things that can distract us, you know, uh, television shows that we know aren't good and aren't giving us things that are edifying us that then just cause us to go and do something else. You know, uh, Micah learned his first cuss word this week. Uh, dang it, you know, but not dang it. So, from a show that we had on the television. See what I mean? Little things like that. That's like if you don't react to it, he will think nothing of it. Oh, no, we didn't react to it, and he still kept going. Yeah, oh. so Throughout the day, so word. and he brought up another thing over and over again. Uh, so we spanked him for it, and he hasn't done it since. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, it's things like that. You know, we don't really think about it, but you know, the wealth of this world is a great distraction. Having too much money and having too much things in this world is a death sentence spiritually. Honestly, like, there is just something that happens when we have too much stuff. It, it it lulls us to sleep. It makes us feel secure. We're not meant to feel that secure in, in this earth. I mean, it's okay to feel like, you know, okay to sleep at night. I'm not saying you have to walk around the world in constant anxiety. I'm just saying there comes a point where it's like, when is it going to be enough? 
you know, when can you just let it go and start focusing on other people's needs? You know, and for the American church, it's not really a thing to focus on other people's needs. So, uh, get rid of the things of the cult. I mean, this is just, I mean, we've been talking about this a lot. Ask for protection from God and get rid of those things of the cult. You know, like, for instance, sometimes we'll be married to somebody and they won't be instantly on board with our idea of getting rid of things of the cult. So, what do you do then? Well, for that, I would definitely recommend before you do anything, you know, go to the Lord in prayer. Um, renounce Satan in your life. Absolutely. When people get out of the cult, you have to, like, take verbal responsibility for what you've done. Confess what you've done to God and then renounce what you've done. You know, Satan, I am no longer going to do this. I renounce your ways. I, renac I renounce what I what I used to do. You know, and then, you know, people think with confession that they're just, you know, hey, I just have to believe that God's out there somewhere. No, 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 no. Confession means you are confessing what you have done to God. You're asking for him to forgive you. You're leaning wholly on his grace to forgive you. That's confession. It's a whole thing that goes with it. Um, so Ephesians 6, uh, I just put 12, but it's really that whole section there, um, however much you really want to read, where it talks about the, come on, where it talks about the, uh, come on, jeez, where it talks about the armor of, uh, of God. So 6, uh, we'll start in like 10, I guess. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness uh, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that, you will not be, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, okay, let our, let yourself be known by truth and righteousness. Do the right thing and believe what is true, not miss. Um, and having sh uh, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, go forth and evangelize like God called us to, right? Go into all the nations, baptizing them, right? Remember that thing? Um, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, when you exercise your faith more and more, you know, trust in God in the harder and harder circumstances, Satan will continue to, sh to try and bring these things by. They get you distracted. But see, what faith does is it's like a shield. Faith is like a shield. Because as Satan shoots these arrows at us that, that would have pained us and caused us great sorrow, our faith is not in whether or not an arrow came. Our faith is in God. And we know what he promised and we know who he is, right? So our faith is unshook no matter what comes our way, right? That's what he's talking about, the faith that is a shield. So anyways, um, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. In other words, you know, salvation is key in all this process. <laughs> but then he says the last thing there, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then he talks about prayer there in verse 18. And then James 4, 7, I'm not going to turn there. You can turn there if you want. But he just says pretty much resist the devil and he will flee from you. So a different type of attacks. Obviously, the most uh, the most severe would be demonic possession. However, we talked about this. Christians cannot be demon-possessed because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit does not cohabitate. Wait, is that the right word? Cohabitate. Yeah. Suddenly it sounds wrong. Cohabitate. I think that's the right word. Yeah. It does not coexist. I'll just switch words anyways, just in case. The Holy Spirit does not coexist inside of us with demons. That's just not a thing that happens. If the Holy Spirit is in us, you don't have to worry about being demon-possessed. Uh, however, I wouldn't recommend going out and playing with the occultic things. No. <laughs> Once again, you can be, number two, demonically oppressed. Oppression happens in varying levels, depending on many factors. Some of the factors are, are you living in sin? Yes, no. Um, are you, or have you recently come in contact with tools of the occult? Or is anyone in your family playing with tools of the occult? Like Ouija boards, for instance. Um, do you have movies in, in the house that are not good? Music in the house that's not good. Do I mean? Stuff like that. Uh, you know, I don't know how this works. The demonic realm doesn't possess things, okay? But they get very possessive about things. I don't know exactly how this works. For instance, in a house where there's been seances, like that pastor and that, and that parsonage, um... It's like demons start staking claims on physical places in the world. I don't know how that works. I really don't. But somehow it does. 
So if you move into a house that they on TV they don't know what to call it, so they call it this house is haunted. You know, and it's like, well, I, kind of yes and no. That that's kind of true and kind of not true. It's true in the sense of if demonic activity has been going on there, chances are it will try and continue because demons don't like to leave. Um, however, there's also another thing that the house itself isn't haunted so much as the place has just experienced a lot of satanic Negative. stuff. Even though it's empty. Yes. How does that work? I don't know. Huh. I'm not sure. Maybe they just like screwing with people and making people think that it's haunted, and that way, sure. you know, yeah. huh. like yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of examples of a house where, where people who served Satan and do those kinds of things there, then they moved out. The next people came in, nightmares and all these different things. They moved. The next people came in, and the house suddenly burned down under mysterious circumstances. There's one story that he tells in here where the kid went to the mom and, and was talking about this this um, this creature that was talking to her at night. And she said, well, what does it say to you, sweetie? And she said, it tells me to kill you. Oh. Kind of creepy, right? Yeah. <laughs> kind of creepy. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yeah, a little creepy, right? Um, and that's kind of, the, kind of the thing. It's yeah. like things can't be possessed, but... Demons can interact with things in the physical realm. How does that work? I don't quite understand. But they can pick stuff up in the physical realm. They can throw it around. So like levitation, for instance, why is that so hard to believe? It's just a demon is lifting something up. Why is that so hard to believe? Like, yeah. <laughs> of all the things, you know, to, to disbelieve. But demonic oppression comes in many forms. Um, sometimes they come in more lighter forms, like simply feeling overly depressed uh, over a certain time. I'm not talking about mental, de I mean, uh, uh, a, a physical depression where you need, like, medication, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about something that's out of the ordinary. Right. An intense heaviness that isn't characteristic and just kind of comes on suddenly and just kind of stays with you. That kind of stuff. Or sometimes it can be a little bit more intense, like... Um, nightmares. Nightmares. Yeah. Uh, partial paralysis, those kinds of things. Um, you know, it's not really possession... But it is, to varying levels, oppression. Sometimes more intense, sometimes less less intense. So there is that. Now, here is something that I have noticed. If you're not toying around with things, and you're staying in prayer, and you know, you've, you know, for lack of better words, sanctified your house, you've prayed over it and everything from room to room and that kind of stuff, in my experiences, those people aren't going to have problems with nightmares and that kind of stuff. If they have dem demonic attacks, it's going to be more things like depression. More things like anxiety. More things like worry. You know, Jesus told us not to worry the same as he told us not to commit murder. Right? But we there's some things we just kind of excuse. And, you know, that's different. Like gluttony, for instance. I mean, I, you know, pornography. Oh, it's not really that big of a deal because it's not really a person I'm sleeping with. And it's like, it's not really what Jesus said, though. You know, he said, you know, if you look at it, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really like... <laughs> That dumbed down. Uh, so the next level, world systems. Now this is something that we don't actually think of a, an attack on us, and yet it is. The world itself is governed somehow by this. I mean, obviously, you know, Satan has something to do with it here, but somehow it's just something in the world is has a wearing down effect. And in Revelations, it seems like he's building on this idea that Satan will continue to have influence in world economics. He will continue to ha have uh, an influence on, on world governments and that kind of different thing. Okay, so James chapter 4 uh, starts off with, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Yeah, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. You can only serve one master. Either you're going to serve the world and all its physical pleasures, or you're not. But you can't serve both. So here we have three systems here. Possession, oppression, and world systems. But there's a fourth one too. The physical part of us. Now we are not a two-part being. Spirit and flesh. Okay, We are one person. Okay, our flesh is not divided from our spirit. But with that being said, we do have different parts of us. And one part of us is a physical body which is a, has a fallen nature. Even though we are saved and we are being remade and changed, there is still part of us that dwells in this physical world. And until the resurrection, we're going to have to deal with these things. Um, 
1 Peter 4, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to li live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, uh, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. In other words, these people that you're associating with, they don't understand why you're abstaining from these things. Well, in America, that's not really a thing, because American Christians don't believe in abstaining from things. <laughs> Anyways, um, so practice and prepare. And what I mean by that is I don't mean this. Okay, Chuck, we're going to practice, okay? Demon can't have you. Now you do it to me. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about practice and prepare in the sense of stay in prayer. Right. You know, stay in the word. And these things, when you have to face these things, it's not going to be foreign to you because you know what the word says. Okay? Um, so, so prepare like you would if you're going to run a marathon. Right? Okay. And then uh, we can win if we place our trust in God. You know, we don't have to face, uh, you know, failure after failure with the, when we're fighting with the demonochrome. That's not how it goes. Um, so, everybody good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as far as counseling, they had a really good chapter in there. Um, I, you know, obviously, really condensing stuff at this point because we're looking at four different chapters tonight. Um when you are counseling people that have been in the cult, it's very important that if you are spiritually immature or physically immature, that you do not get involved. The reason for this is because you're just not equipped for it. Would you give Micah, my son, my three-year-old son, would you give him a sword or a gun and tell him to go out and, and, and fight the ISIS, ISIS people? I, mean, I wouldn't. He's going to, I mean, A, he might accidentally shoot himself. Right. B, he might accidentally shoot me. Right. C, he might accidentally shoot a civilian. <laughs> D, he might actually hit somebody. Who knows? Or E, he might not do anything. <laughs> See what I mean? You just can't know. It's just not a good idea. Right. Not only that, but he's not physically equipped. Like, he would die. Like, this is just a terrible idea. But yet, when it comes to spiritual things, we somehow think that this is okay. And it's like, that's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that, that Paul said about uh, pastors. Don't let, don't let somebody be a pastor if they're young. Don't, if they're young in the Lord, he says. Um, it, uh, uh, fighting with the cult is really only possible through prayer and fasting. You know, there's just a certain power that we have when we're staying in prayer, and there's a certain power that's not there when we're not in prayer. You know, just because you once upon a time were filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that that means you never pray again. Um, don't start fights with the devil. Oh my gosh, I cannot emphasize this enough. You know how many stories I've heard and people who I've actually talked to with a, well, I just told Satan to get out of here and I, you sucker, you better. Get yeah. And then like, they'll do stupid right. things like you demons, if you're around or you, you come here and it's like, okay, okay, let's calm down here, friend. This is a bad idea. That's about the time I make my exit. I'm like, no. <laughs> like for instance, God protected Daniel from the lion, but you didn't see Daniel going out there. Poking at the lions, did you? No, no, he was thrown into the lion pit, and God protected him. Right. That's how it is with us. You don't go out there and poke the lion, no. but you might get thrown into the lions. Then you just have to trust God in those moments. See right. what I mean? Like that's just how it works. Right, right. Um, right. Be obedient to God's leading. God may lead you to somewhere in the future where you have to deal with the cult, and He may not. You can't worry about those kinds of things. You just have to trust God, and God will lead you to places and protect you in different circumstances according to what he wants. Okay, So it is possible for Christians... Um, it is possible for Christians to accept what God teaches. Um, oftentimes, Christians will try and deny the Holy Spirit and then still get a foot up in the cult. And it's like, well, that's not really how that works. You can't just pick out parts that you like and then say, I'm going to live by this, and the rest of it I'm going to ignore. You know, it's just... No. That doesn't work like that. Um, what God what? What God teaches. Um, so there's just a, a few things here. When you're when you are counseling with someone who's been in the cult, these are just some some steps. And I've already talked about demonic possession. You know, signs of demonic possession. But just a real quick walkthrough. If you're interested, he has in here at the very end a questionnaire for you to do um, when you're counseling with people. Um, and I thought it was I thought it was very well done. Um, that like I'll just read you some of the questions they have. For instance, does it seem to be centered in? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
what paranormal phenomenon have been experienced and or observed? And then it has a list there and it says other and you can take notes and everything. Is it still occurring? How often? Does it seem to be centered on one particular person? So it has all these questions you can go through when you're counseling, you know, to just kind of get an idea. Because this is what people do. Sometimes they think, I'll just know if there's a demon. Have you ever seen some mental illnesses? Some mental illnesses are very creepy, but there's no demonic activity. Right. I mean, it's just the way of things, you know what I mean? <laughs> then there's some things that it's just like, it doesn't seem like there's anything demonic going on, but then there is. So, uh, the first question, is there any mental illness? Has it been diagnosed? Are they on any medication? Because these are all factors that can change the outcome. Um, is the person living in sin? Like, he gave the example of a Christian uh, who married a non-Christian, and the non-Christian, uh, because he was doing different things, um, a demon started contacting their daughter. And um, so one of the things that he was talking about was, well, you weren't supposed to marry a non-Christian. So the first thing you need to do is confess your sins. Now, why did he bring that up? Because unconfessed sins, check this out, Satan and the demonic realm will bring up the things that you have done that you haven't asked forgiveness for. They'll rub it in your face, they'll embarrass you in front of everybody. You can't just go into go into spiritual warfare assuming that, you know, it's okay. This is going to be fine. It's fine. It's not like that. It's dangerous. Okay? It is dangerous. Um, however, we know that we stand in faith in Christ. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean you should under, like, just throw caution to the wind. Um, idols in the house. And I was going to give more uh, examples, and I just thought that's good enough. We've gone through the call that you guys already, you know, know the things to look out for. Um, but living in sin. Okay, uh, direct or indirect interaction with the cult. Sometimes you will encounter demonic activity because of someone you know or someone who's close to you who's con who's having a cultic contact. Does that make sense? Sometimes you will encounter demonic forces because of the house that you lived in, somebody before you lived there, and did things like seances. These are things that you have to acknowledge and you have to deal with. Because, for instance, in the case of a house that, that, that is, you know, trenched in this kind of stuff, if you don't deal with it, it's not going away. The only other option is to move out. So, I mean, if you want to move out, I guess you could do that too. You know, whatever. Obviously, if you have something with you or if you have tampered in the cult, it's just going to move with you. For instance, if you have a Ouija board in that house and you have demonic activity and then you move and take the Ouija board with you, it's just going to move with you to the next house. All right. So... What about, yeah. yeah, like you move into a house that's like that, it has demonic activity and stuff, mm -hmm. and you don't mess with it, but then you move, can it move with you then? It you know, there's no reason to house. assume that it wouldn't, but um, that's assuming you're a non-Christian. You know, obviously if you're a Christian, a lot of times, um, from all the, all the stories that I've ever read, um, the demonic activity will leave when they move. You know what I mean? It'll be like basically um, a pissing contest where the demons don't want to leave and the Christians don't want the activity to continue, so they'll just move. And oftentimes, demons will just stay there and be fine with it. But sometimes they will. It just really depends on the situation, once again, on whether or not you have something going on like you're living in sin. You know, sometimes they'll just kind of latch on. <laughs> um, then sometimes you'll get the victory in the house that you lived in that you're living in or whatever, and then you'll move and somebody else will move in, and the demonic activity will start all over again with that person. Uh, huh. It really just depends. You know, um, there's there's typical rules, but then there's always those, those right. circumstances that are just different from what normally happens. Um, okay, so then uh, uh, look for unexplainable phenomenon. Anything like that, okay? Uh, somebody talking in a voice that's not their own. Things that can't be explained. Um, a, a child that sees a creature. Mm -hmm. One guy was sleeping. He woke up and looked, and there was somebody sitting at the foot of his bed. And that creeped the crap out of him. He was a Christian. Mm -hmm. It'd be like, you need to go. <laughs> and the face turned towards him, and he saw the face, and it was a, uh, he, he defined it as a beautiful face, but he was struck with intense fear, and just it was just very very frightening. Well, we know that um, angels obviously are, are fearful to look at. Obviously, we see that in the Gospels, for instance. Yeah. But this was different than that. There was a certain heaviness that went with this. Not only that, but angels don't just chill out at the foot of your bed <laughs> waiting no. for you to look so that you can scare the crap out of you. I mean, jeez! Right. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. Boo! <laughs> right? Um, 
um, knocking, that's a real common thing, knocking in another room, uh, doors opening and shutting, uh, sounds of footsteps. Um, now, keep in mind that there oftentimes are explainable things. For instance, like wind. Old houses. Like, like old houses. Uh, wood settles. When, when there's wind, when it's excessive weather outside, when it's a heavy rainstorm. When it's been cold and heat hits the building, it'll make the wood move a little bit, which will cause popping sounds, right. okay? That's not demonic activity. That's no. natural activity. Just like when you walk outside and the wind blows and it rustles the leaves in the tree, that's not demonic. That's nat That's nature, right. okay? You don't have to be afraid of nature. <laughs> but I, I, see what I mean? Like, th th there is certain things. And so you have to be careful with unexplained phenomena because sometimes you'll have somebody who's very, um, uh, what's it called? Paranoid. Paranoid, yeah, that's that's a word, but it's not the word I'm looking for. Um you know, mystical into um, folklore, into what's yeah, that called? Uh, superstitious. superstitious. Yes, baby, yeah. superstitious. <laughs> yes, exactly. Where they're into superstitions. Okay, yes, absolutely. And so they'll just think that all these things are happening. It's like, okay, let's calm down there, friend. It was windy last Tuesday, so let's just calm down with that. Um, and oftentimes, though, it'll be repeated, though. You know. And it'll be something where it's not windy and the door yeah. is still opening yeah. you know stuff like that um so you really have to be careful with diagnosing it as for sure demonic you know you just really got to be careful um there are some things to look out for and you just got to kind of you know get used to it but then there's never a situation where you should say i just know what i'm talking about you know you have to look at every circumstances maybe or maybe not um so to prepare yourself for, for uh, spiritual warfare, confess your sins, stay in prayer. Turn away from sins. Don't just confess them to God. Stop doing them. Um, study well. You know, the Bible says to, st sorry, to study to show yourself approved. You know, know what you're talking about, honestly. Um, and then control your thoughts and get help where you need it. Do you need to be on medication? Then stop being stubborn and go get medication. See what I mean? Like, people are, are so convinced in the more charismatic and Pentecostal churches that everything is spiritual that they completely <laughs> deny the physical world. See what I mean? And which is funny because they're often the ones that are having, you know, these pastors that are like 500 pounds telling people, don't look at pornography while I, you know, overeat. It's like, well, you are having no self restraint in your eating and you want me to have self restraint in my sexual life. Yeah. Huh. That doesn't really fit, does it? But it's different because, you know, the spiritual world is completely different from the physical world. Well, it doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? In fact, um, it was really, I'm sure you guys remember, about a year ago, I got really big. And I was using food as a crutch. And it just made my depression worse. You know? And um, I got victory over depression, but I, I started working on my, on my diet first. I don't think that it was necessarily related because I've been struggling with depression my whole life. This is this year is the first year that I've actually had victory over my depression. And I've been alive for 26 years. So I don't think that the diet was all of it. Because <laughs> I've, I've been healthy before, but I've never had victory over my depression before. So anyways, um, so obviously the physical world isn't everything, but neither can it be ignored. Um, control your thoughts. What I mean by that is don't let your thoughts run wild. Don't let worry have the last say in your head. Don't don't let these things just go crazy, okay? you got to put an end to it. Which takes us to something that I have long wanted to talk about, generational curses. I have wanted to talk about generational curses literally for years, and I, I've just it just never has come up. you know. Um, so there's a few things. First off, generational curses do not apply to Christians. That's the first thing. Basically, what a generational curse is is where somebody does something – and it puts a curse on the child, okay, where either they will have to struggle with something or um, they lose out on blessings from God or something like that. When you are saved, any generational curse is gone. It's just that's just how that's just the way of things, okay? Mm -hmm. However, you may still struggle with things that your parents struggled with. See, our problem is that we get bitter embittered towards our parents and we think, oh no, I don't have that same problem. Like for instance. Let's say my dad is an alcoholic. Now, I get saved, and I'm very embittered to him because all he did was drink. So um, I don't drink. You know, I'm, I'm a great family man, but I still have that same anger. See, maybe think of it like this. What if he had an anger problem, and that caused him to drink? 
all I saw was the drinking. But what he really had a problem with was his anger. And if the anger went away, the drinking would have gone away. But because I have focused on the drinking, that thing that I didn't like, I have ignored the real problem, his anger, and I have continued that same pattern. That does definitely happen. Okay. Now, this doesn't really fall under the line of generational curses. It's just the things that we do impact people around us. You see this in the, in the books of the law, for instance, where Israel was commanded to go into Canaan and kill off all the people there. It says men, women, and child. Yeah. Well, the children didn't do anything wrong, right? The things that we do impact other people. In fact, God says it like this. When you practice a, the activities of the cult, your whole household suffers for it. Everyone in your house suffers for it. In fact, the books of the law are, 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 have a bunch of examples of where somebody sinned and their whole house was destroyed. Everything that was theirs, even their belongings, were destroyed. See what I mean? Because... Things bring curses like that. Okay, now I'm not talking about you know weird stuff. I'm talking about occultic stuff brings curses. If I keep a Ouija board in my house, you can rest assured that Mike will have problems. Then he will have an unnatural lean towards the occult because of what I have allowed, and if he gives into it, he will deal with it to a wor to a worse degree, and then it'll carry on becoming progressively worse and worse, because that's how the occult works. It's called the generational curses, and they do exist. This is the problem. In the modern Pentecostal church, generational curses have been taken to a very dark place. Basically, everything that that your parents do, I mean, it, it puts a curse on you that you just have to repent for, and it's like, okay, this is what the Bible actually says. I will make the person who sins suffer for their sin. I will not punish somebody for somebody else's sin. That's what, that's what the Bible actually says. So in other words, is there such a thing as a generational curse? Not if you've been saved, there's not. That's how, that's how it goes. If you've been saved, you don't have to worry about that. However, you might still have to worry about the different skeletons in the closet. Were your parents practitioners in the cult? Then you may have to renounce Satan in your household. Now, why would you have to do that if you'd never partaken of the occult? Because it was in the house. Generational curses do rest in an area. Absolutely. Have you ever noticed that some places are more spiritually dark than other places? You you drive by um, that place in Louisiana, New Orleans. You drive by New Orleans and you just feel something in your spirit. You know what I mean? There's just something that just feels off. You don't get that everywhere you go. Tularosa. I have never felt a heaviness of anywhere that I've ever lived in my life as there is in Tularosa. It's a very spiritually foggy place. Very much so it needs a strong Christian church here. It's like things things are weird here. Like you'll feel things that you've never felt anywhere else. You know, just a heaviness resides here in this Tularosa Basin that hasn't been dealt with by the church. It's just been ignored. And I don't think that that's a sufficient solution to the problem. Um, individuals are held accountable for their own sins. I mentioned this. Our actions do, however, directly affect those around us. Okay. Sometimes the things that we do make our children live a, live a shorter life. I mean, that's just the way it goes. I mean, it's just it's a bad, it's a terrible thing, but that's just how it is. Um, when we continue the sins of our fathers, it progressively gets worse in us. It's just something that, that accumulates. That's the generational curse. Um, and the sins that we cling to, our children will often struggle with. Okay, my grandpa, he was an alcoholic. My dad, he was an alcoholic. My brother, he was an alcoholic. See? Generational. But what I did, when I got to be uh, about 10, is I said, Lord, I am making this oath to you that I will never be an alcoholic. And I stood by it, and I think that, God, that God's blessed me for it, because it was a generational thing, and I took my stand against it. I said, God, I know what your word says about being a drunk, and I'm not going to do that. I am making the choice today not to do that. And I did that. Now, I'm not saying that I've never had alcohol, because I have had NyQuil, for instance. I have not ever drank just alcohol, like beer. I have not ever done social drinking. The only alcohol that I have consumed is when alcohol is present in a medication, like NyQuil. Right. That's the only alcohol I have ever ingested. And the reason for that is because, A, I don't need to become an alcoholic. I don't need to struggle with something else that I already don't have a problem with. B, I don't think there's anything in Scripture that says, hey, you should be an alcoholic. 
It, there's things that say you can drink, absolutely, but there's nothing in the Bible that says that you should be a drunk. In fact, there's the exact opposite, that you shouldn't be a drunk. Next off, I know that my whole family has struggled with it, so why would I tempt myself to see how close I can get to something before I fall? I mean, it's just a bad idea. Um, everybody good on that? Yeah. Okay, so about the Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit here. First off, there's a difference between gift and, gifts and fruit. The gifts of the Spirit are something that every Christian displays when they're saved. Kindness and gentleness and, and all those things, right? Ever, that's something that the Holy Spirit does in all of us. The fruit is something that the Holy Spirit picks and chooses what to give to who. Not everybody's going to prophesy. Not everybody's going... That mixed up. What? The gifts are what he gives to you. The fruit. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I did. I'm sorry. Well, Chuck is right. Knows. I said that backwards. The fruit of the Spirit are the ones that... Yes, are the, are the things that everybody gets. Every Christian gets this. Those are things that the Holy Spirit does in all of us, like gentleness and kindness. The gifts are the things that the Holy Spirit specifically chooses specific things for specific people. Um, God equipping somebody to uh, to pray for someone and they'll be healed. God equipping somebody to um, have, a, have a word that's given. These are things that the Holy Spirit chooses and gives to whom he will. Um, and so when we're talking about dealing with the spiritual warfare, you don't have to be filled with the Holy Spirit to predict a spiritual warfare. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There are some people, like Walter Martin confessed in this book, he said, I, I, I have never spoken in tongues. But he's casted out many demons. See what I mean? Just because you haven't been, don't have a gift of the Spirit doesn't mean that you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Yeah. See what I'm saying? So everybody's able of it. Um, and all, 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 everything with the Holy Spirit is always shown in love. You know, if you have somebody who claims to be doing something in the Spirit and they're just real hateful, that's probably not real true. You know, I mean, somebody claims to have a word, word from God or whatever, and then their life just does not match up. Chances are not. Sometimes God will use people like like Balaam, for instance, in the book of Numbers, a very immoral person that God used to prophesy to Israel multiple times. I think it was like three or four times. See what I mean? So God can do those kinds of things. Um, but uh, usually when God speaks, our lives are changed. When, when, when we experience the Holy Spirit, it changes us. We don't just keep experiencing the Holy Spirit and then say, "Okay, God, you keep you keep playing the flute, and I'm going to keep on having fun and doing whatever I want." That's not really how it goes. Um, the what the Spirit does, He does for the better of God's people. Um, he doesn't allow something unbiblical. Okay, just because somebody claims to be speaking, you know, by the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean that what they say can contradict the Bible. Oh, it's different. I have a special revelation. It's like, well, okay, I've already heard that one before, and it has to match up with the Bible. Um, God is still not okay with sin. Just because you know we're using the gifts and we're not under the law anymore doesn't mean that all of a sudden God's okay with sin. You know, hey, I can have idols in my house. I can do these different things because I'm free from the law. Well, it's still wrong. You see, I mean, just because you're not under the law doesn't mean that morals have changed. God didn't suddenly like, okay, I've sent Jesus. Now you guys do whatever you want. I'll check back on you whenever I feel like coming back again. That's not really how that goes. Um, so. No, I thought you had it. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to go back? Yeah. <coughs> there you go. That's fine. So about the cult, these are things from the book of Acts. It always opposes the gospel. It desires to turn people away from the faith. It's full of deceit. It's the devil's child. Okay, that's, that's the cult. The cult is, is Satan's Satan's child. You know, obviously, I'm speaking in metaphors here. Um, it's the enemy of righteousness. It's a perverter of God's ways. It seeks to change the ways that God has made. You know, that's just a thematic of the occult. So, how do we reach these people? Well, there's kind of two different views that people go to extremes on. The first is, you know, hey, you got to sugarcoat everything. It's all about filling up the pews, right? Settle for their attendance. As long as you're coming, it's okay. You never offend anybody. Love means keeping silent about sin. You know, you can't ever point out anything right or wrong. You just kind of got to go with it. Um, you have to be tolerant of the culture and be sensitive to people. Um, missionary dating is totally okay. Uh, you got to appease the crowds. And then there's the people on the other side of the spectrum. You've got to argue about everything. Rush their con conversion. As soon as you see them, you better give them the opportunity right then in Walmart that they better repent or perish right then. You know, it's everything's rushed. Uh, it's like they attempt to be offensive. You know, if I can offend them, surely I can change them. Love means condemning their actions. 
If I really love them, I'll condemn them and tell them that they're Satan's offspring. Um, intolerant of everything. If you're doing anything, it's wrong. Uh, distance from the world. You know, I can't be associated with these hoodlums. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna talk to homosexual unless it's to tell them how sinful they are. So, I mean, all these different things like that. Uh, uninterested in others' emotions. I don't care about being tactful. I don't need to be tactful because I've got the power of God. See, there's people that, on these two extremes, and it's just neither of those extremes are healthy. Okay, there's a nice, nice, happy way to be. Um, he was telling, he was asking a question in his book that I think applies. You, you are friends with the Mormon, and his wife dies. She was Mormon, and he asks you if he believes in Jesus, will he see his wife again? Now, see if you're on the left side of this, you're gonna say, "Sure, you'll see her again, and do anything to make him feel happy again, so he'll accept Jesus." You'll lie to him. If you're on the right side of this, you will just say, you know what? Your wife was living in sin. She got exactly what she deserved. You better turn before you get exactly what you deserve. But there's something nice in the middle where you don't have to lie to the person, but you can be sensitive. Yeah. You know, For instance, I am really sorry for your loss. But that doesn't mean that you have to lie to him. Unless you believe in Jesus, there is no other way. In which case, he will probably respond to me like this, then I don't want to go to heaven. And then you say something like this. It's not worth going to hell. <laughs> like, hell is a very miserable place. Like, it's a very terrible place. You're going to have to lean on the Holy Spirit for how to explain that. You know, but the thing is, don't lie to people. But don't be offensive. Like, there well, is a middle ground. An another thing that people don't take into consideration a lot of times is, like, um, the Bible tells us, you're not going to, like, be married and stuff in heaven. Right. Like, those relationships, once you die, those are gone, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. It's not like you're going to see them in hell either. Right. Like. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so there's a better way of evangelizing. Take a stand for righteousness. You do what's right, right? Do what's right. You do what's right. At the right time, give answers. When there's an opportunity, witness to them. Absolutely. But don't force something that's not there. Now, don't just tell them what is right. You, you will also oftentimes have to engage in apologetics. This is the defense of the faith, explaining why you believe something. Now, oftentimes people will just ignore apologetics. That doesn't matter. But that's not really sufficient because people will have questions about the faith. They will. Most of the New Testament is apologetic. Um, be led by the Holy Spirit in your interactions. Don't give up when rejected, but don't be in their face. Okay, there's a fine line between. Oops, sorry. There's a fine line between. Okay, well they gave up. I'm going to the next person. You know, pray for them. Stay in prayer for them. You know what I mean? God isn't finished with them just because they rejected what you were offering. Now Paul oftentimes had to give up and go on because he was a missionary trying to establish the gospel in different places. But not all Christians did what Paul did. Um. But don't be in their face. Don't cram it down their throat. Honestly, you're going to do more harm than good. Okay, Look for the right opportunity. But don't make it out to be as though you're just using them. You just want you just want them to convert, and you're, so you're putting up a false front. Be real. But do it when the right time comes. Um, explain what and why. Don't, don't, don't leave it off. Explain the what's of salvation and the why's. You know, answer people's questions. Don't be... Um, standoffish. Don't try to be offensive, but don't hide the truth. There is a middle ground there. Um, and also use tact. The proverb says to make wisdom acceptable to people. You know, it's just like that. Everything. Um, oh, I already said that, so I don't really need to say that again. Um, and then, last things here. Be aware. Um, of modern research, if somebody has has something that's 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 causing them to not believe in God, like evolution, for instance, be aware of modern research. You know what I mean? Be aware of, of what they're because even Paul will appeal to things that are non-Christian. He'll appeal to secular sources. Paul does that frequently. So frequently, um, appeal on a the level they understand. Talk to them where they're at. Right. Don't talk to them in like this high, mighty Christian terms and stuff. Explain to them where it's at, right? Uh -huh. Hey does no good if the cow can't get to it, <laughs> right? right? Put it where they can understand it. Talk to them with what they're familiar with. Use terms that they are familiar with. Are you talking to a farmer? Then don't use a bunch of scientific terms. <laughs> 
Are you talking about somebody who, who treasures science above everything else? Then don't come off like an ignorant hillbilly. So I mean, like there is a, a appeal to people where they're at. You know what I mean? Don't try and change them to you so that you can witness to them. Um, welcome them in and be patient. Don't welcome people in with ulterior motives. I want you to come to our young adult meeting, but just so that I can tell you how you're living in sin. So I mean, don't have ulterior motives. Um, be patient with them. Stay in prayer. Stay in prayer all times. Be in prayer. Be faultless before God. Be at the point where you're staying in such faith that, that, that God has nothing against you. Obviously, I'm not talking about never messing up. I'm talking about don't live in sin. Give answers, but don't be combative. Don't attack people's character. You're a moron for believing this. And don't attack people. You know what I mean? Even when you do attack an idea, don't attack the person. See what I mean? Reincarnation to me is absolutely crazy. It's absolutely stupid. It's comforting, but stupid. There's no sufficient reason to believe in it. There's no evidence for it. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. For instance, the world is continually more and more populated by more and more people. Where are these spirits coming from? If it's all reincarnation, then that would mean that they're going from one body to another body. What about flies? Flies have a very short lifespan. But yet there seems to be more and more of them. If reincarnation is will, some, is real, something has to give somewhere. There has to be, you know, something that's switching bodies or something like that just doesn't make sense. Um, and then also the call to dreams of a world where your uniqueness will disappear. Will you be, will you will be part of an unconscious existence and taken into a collective where you will no longer be you? That's the dream of the cult. That's not God's dream. God's dream is that He made you as an individual. Sadly, you were corrupted with sin, so there are parts of you that have to change. However, you are still a person created uniquely by God to be you. And when you get to heaven, you will still be you. You will just be perfected. That make sense? That sounds a lot better than just maybe not existing. We won't know, you know what I mean? Because we won't, we won't have our individual consciousness to know if we exist. Um, so don't be a sellout. Don't sell the message of the gospel. Don't, don't, don't. Don't back down from what the Bible says. When people look to you for truth, when people look to you in their times of desperation, don't be a sellout and just do something that feels comfortable. Because this is what we rationalize. I don't want to lose friends. I don't want to be that weird person. Don't be a sellout. God has placed you in a place, and God says this, that if I've told you to say something to somebody and you don't say it to that person, I'm holding it on your head. That's kind of a big thing. That means you can be punished for somebody else's sin because God told you to speak and you didn't speak. Now, what do you do if you do that? Well, you repent. You say you apologize to God. You confess what you've done. You seek after him. He forgives you for it, and you move on. The only sin that is unforgivable okay, is the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So stop not t speaking when God tells you to speak. Confess that what you've done in the past and move on. Right? God doesn't want you to live in yesterday. You might have messed up, but you know, leave it there. Uh, don't pretend to know what you don't. When you're talking to somebody and they ask a question that you don't know about, be real with them. I don't know. You know what I mean? Don't don't pretend to know all this knowledge that you don't know. Um, remember that what you say influences others. Every time you say something, especially when people are in need, they're gonna remember what you said. Okay, they're gonna remember the attitude you said it in too. Don't don't forget that. You know, um, what you are doing and what you are saying influences others. If you decide to abandon your walk with Christ and, and pursue the, you know, something else. It's not just you that's going to suffer. It's other people who know you are going to suffer too. The people who you have direct contact with, they're going to suffer. You're going to affect everybody around you. That's how things work. Is that fair? Should I be held accountable for my brother's sin? And yet you still are. Like I'm not saying whether it's fair or not. I'm saying that's how it is. And don't forget in all these things that God still died for these people. So the last thing I want to mention about is the flaw of the modern day testimony. I experienced a change in my heart. Your testimony is completely dependent on your experience. Not on truth, not on fact, but on your experience. So they're experiencing things too. The people in the cult, they're experiencing things. You know what that means? It's good that you have this testimony and it's working for you, but that's not for them. See what I mean? Because you've made it all about our experience. And they they are admitting that too. I'm experiencing something in the world of the cult. We had a seance and I talked to my dead Uncle George. 
See what I mean? Because they're experiencing something too, and when your testimony is only about what has, has been experienced, it's not really a testimony. See what I mean? It's good to experience things, but that's not all there is to Christianity. Christianity is based on facts. Moses actually climbed a mountain and actually communicated with God where he actually got the law. Fact. These are things that can't be ignored. All of Israel saw this happen. They heard the thunder. They, they, they heard the trumpet blast. They heard these things. They saw it with their own eyes. So, I mean, they saw Moses' shining face. The, the apostles of Jesus, they saw him rise from the dead. They saw it with their own eyes. Like, these aren't things that can just be laughed off. These are actual historical facts. And that is what Christianity is based on, not feelings. In fact, Moses even says in the book of De Deuteronomy, I was shaking with fear. This was a very scary thing for me. <laughs> but that wasn't the heart of, heart of the law, was it? It was, this is what God says. In fact, if you read through Leviticus, it says like this, Then God said this. Then God said this. Then God said this. It doesn't say, God said this, and then Moses felt like this. And Moses' life was changed because his heart was touched. So, I mean, it's good to experience things, but that's not all there is in Christianity. Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness and no salvation. A lot of people call themselves Christians, walk the walk, experience things, go to worship services, and really feel the tingles all over, but they're not saved. There is a big difference there. Emotions are good, but in... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to say that word. But incorporate fact, reason, and logic into your, into your salvation story. Right? It makes sense to believe in a creator. It doesn't make sense that nothing came... I mean, everything came from nothing. That doesn't make sense. Scientifically, that doesn't make sense. Like, it's just nonsense. Uh, anyways, so make sure that in your testimonies... And also appeal to where they're at. If they're in an emotional state, then cool it with the reason. Appeal to them with emotions. But if they're more of fact-driven people, appeal to them with fact. See what I mean? Christianity has both. Don't focus one over the other. Um, and if you do have to focus one over the other, make sure you focus reason and logic over emotions every time. So, um, the question of the week, which I hope you'll bring next week, because we're going to um, talk about next week, we're going to do a recap of everything we looked at this year. And we're going to talk about a few other things, and that will be next week's lesson. Uh, the second week of Tuesday, we're going to be watching a lecture by Dr. Plongberg about the, um, the historical reliability of the New Testament. Um, it's a very good lecture. I've seen it a couple times myself. Um, and then the third week of December will be a Christmas party. So, um, But make sure you bring any anything that you would like us to talk about next year um, to the discussion. And we'll get it all recorded and everything so that we can plan for next year. Okay? Any questions about the occult? Because we are done with the occult. Done. Finish. El fine. Questions? Comments? Anything? I'm going to stop the recording. It's going to happen.